Hey folks, Molforan here, and welcome back to the channel. Today we're covering Dev Diary 122 Regencies and the Elegance of the Empire, which is a, uh, a separate DLC. I did release a video already today with the release date announcement for Tools and Tournaments and also covering those DLCs. So uh, watch that if you haven't already and you want to know beforehand, but uh, we will be going over it anyway during this video. So uh, you can just stick around till the end. It is going to be a very long video. This is probably even bigger Dev Diary than last week. I did split last week's Dev Diary up, but as this is all about Regencies, I'm just going to do one big video. So uh, if you do enjoy it, hit that like button. Subscribe if you're new here. I cover all news and uh, games around Crusader Kings, and I also do historical titles as well. So if that's your kind of thing, you know what to do, but we're just going to get straight into it. It's like I say, we got a lot to cover today, and it all looks fantastic. So... Let's get into it. Design ethos around regencies. So a regency or, or an expected regent was a figure of huge importance and subject to plenty of political intrigue, not to mention he was one of the most prominent ways for an unlanded woman to exert soft power on behalf of a family member. Their job was to shepherd the realm when the actual ruler was otherwise indisposed, giving them a tremendous amount of power and authority, but a fairly precarious base for such. So yeah, basically... If you've seen the history of basically any royal family, I think this is basically what, what happened. You had regencies at times. Sometimes they were benign regencies. They basically kind of just were were just nice and helped the probably young king is generally where these are seen in history. You know, a child ruler, well, he can't run the realm if he's like six years old. So they would have a region do it for them. And sometimes they just did it nicely, you know, just build up the realm, be be good, be a good ruler in his stead. And then let him have power when he came of age or sometimes they were not that and basically just ran the country and uh, basically just took over so um, that is how it looks like it's going to basically work in the game as well which is absolutely insane and we will get to that capturing the full scope and scale of the power wielded by someone essentially appointed as a stand-in for the liege was a big ask and something we tried to frame as about providing interesting obstacles to overcome whilst trying to model some of the important attached to the position at the same time, this expansion shining stars or activities, and we needed regencies to be interesting and engaging. Basically, they wanted regencies to play out like a bunch of events as well. So this, I mean, I could almost think this could almost have been a DLC on its own, the regency system uh, that we're going to get to. Uh, from the regent's point of view, we want to give you more opportunity to use and abuse your power. There are a few core player fantasies we try to keep in mind here, giving each mechanic a chance to shine. A scheming regent, greedy for power. A loyal regent, doing the best they can. Or a laissez-faire region, basically just uh, getting some getting some gold, getting some prestige, but generally just kind of going along for the ride and taking a little bit off the side, but not doing anything too bad. So yeah, they're, they're basically the three that they will discuss during this uh, dev diary. So these were the rough goals we set ourselves. Regions need to be fun, offering plenty of interactivity and options of how to play. Interesting for the liege without being too punishing or distracting most of the time, and allow escalation to more serious levels when a region is giving time to flourish and solidify their power so it's good on both sides so if you are a region or if you have a regency um, there's a lot to get to so power sharing sharing power in an entrenched regency which is what they will talk about the different scales uh, later on and uh, yeah so this is the regent of hungary the queen mother anastasia of hungary so she was i guess the king died and this child is too young to uh, to take over and she's the regent and then these are the uh, Regency Succession, which again, they're going to cover, so we won't go into it just now. But what is a Regency? Simply put, when a character needs to manage the day-to-day -day running of a realm, they get a Regent. Historically, this happened for all kinds of reasons. Maybe the king was off on pilgrimage. Maybe he was in prison far from home. Maybe they were too young or too ill to deal with the various tasks and rigorous travails entailed with ruling a kingdom. A Regent was the go-to person for questions that usually go to a healthier, more adult ruler. This position inherently gave them access to no small amount of the Legion's power. When the Regent spoke, they spoke as if they were the king, basically. They kind of took their role, as it were. The thing is, with that sort of unstable arrangement, monarchic power did not like being shared, especially in such an awkward, unofficial fashion. Generally, Regency wouldn't last long enough for this to be a problem, but sometimes they did. Well, no one enjoys quite as excellent an opportunity to slowly take control as somebody who already nominally controlled it. Swinging the scales of power. In game, we represent this tug of war between the liege and their regent with the scales of power, which was in the initial screenshot as well. This is basically, does the, the ruler have more power or does the region have more power? The lower the bar, the more titular the region is. They normally 
are the Liju's second in command, but in practice, they're more or less a figurehead, do more than their basic job. They're basically just kind of no power, just kind of there in the role. The higher the bar, the more power the region actually has. That's not just a reference point for the realm. They're considered an increasingly legitimate source of authority in and of themselves, a dangerous position for the liege to get into. So basically a lot of the vassals and people in the realm almost see the region as the ruler and the king or queen just kind of there, kind of as a figurehead rather than not actually doing anything themselves. Along with the bar, we have different levels. Each level unlocks different interactions or effects. Generally, as the bar increases, the region gets more abilities to allow them to imitate powers that Leech has. And they're going to talk about that in a later part of this dev diary. Whilst adding prestige costs to actions that otherwise would be free, representing the political divisions in the realm, and Leech is needing to spend political capital in order to administer their own lands. So yeah, if, if it swings really far to the region, Things that usually are free are actually going to cost you prestige because you basically don't have power even though you're the ruler and you're having to like use some of your power to just do simple things. So already looks really, really good. Most regions will thus want to keep the bar as high as possible whilst legions want to keep it low as possible. In order to actually affect it, both legion and region have an interaction allowing them to trade various currencies, gold, prestige, and piety for more authority in the realm. Using the influence they accrued elsewhere to sway people to their side of the aisle and there you go. Swing the scales of power. So you can use prestige, piety, gold if you have a hook. Or you can ask your head of faith to swing it. I guess like the Pope comes in and says, hey, wait, this region isn't in charge. Like the king's in charge. What are you what are you guys on about? Hooks into religion as well. Mandates and strife for the liege. That covers things. For the best way to affect the scales are to influence them directly and put themselves in a position where the regency is no longer necessary for the region. There are quite a few options. So you can uh, fill the coffers, get extra gold, free de domain development, feudal contracts adjust in the liege's favor. Mandates are generally tasks the liege can set for their regent. Think of these as little council tasks. Someone has a job, you tell them what you'd like to focus them on, and then how they do it is their own discretion. On the regent's end, you receive events related to your mandate, generally giving you the option to serve the realm dutifully split a benefit with your liege, or even steal it entirely if you're, you know, skullduggery, or bunk off and ignore the important job, just don't do it. Particular skills and traits play into both how good any character is at this and how the AO will react. So this is basically just, you know, if you have a regent, you can say, hey, go get me some gold, and they'll just figure out how to do it. And I guess if they're a good character, they'll do it in good ways. If they're, uh, you know, a bit evil, they might do it in bad ways to get you the money. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see exactly how how many events are tied into that and how it works exactly like in person when playing the game. Splitting a benefit can give an appropriate short-term boost. Bunking off means you don't have to worry about potential costs or challenges, but serving duty reinforces a connection between you and the realm in the minds of your fellow vassals, generally at the personal cost to yourself. The upside of this is it swings the scales of power in your direction a little bit more. So yeah, you can just bunk off and not do it, but then the realm sees that you're just lazy. Whereas if you if you are like the uh, the little finger almost, kind of like doing the tasks for the king or the queen, then the people in the realm are like, hey, this guy's actually doing quite a lot of the work. Maybe he's more important than we think and kind of builds up your power base. So, you know, you definitely want to decide which way you want to do it. Do you want to spend your resources for future benefit, I guess? Or do you want to just bunk off and get some bonuses right now. F fulfilling a mandate isn't without its perils, as using your liege's power, even on his behalf, when you're not a liege, is going to cause a lot of friction with your fellow vassals. Ultimately, to them, you might be a regent, but your job isn't to overstep and boss them around. It's to mind things quietly and leave them alone till the liege can resume control. Thus, strife opinion. So this is a different tier of opinion. It is called strife. Strife's an opinion penalty for the diarch by their fellow vassals. I guess the regent, basically. That might be a regional version, I guess. Strife occurs when the regent uses their borrowed powers or in mandate events, as the regent does not have the same authority as the liege. So this is basically, if you're trying to do things that the liege should do, your fellow vassals are going to be like, wait, you're not supposed to do that. And you can just push it through and say, yeah, but I am going to do it. So <laughs> you can like me a little bit less, but I do what I want. Strife operates a little bit like tyranny, but per the image, affects your fellow vassal's opinion of you rather than your subjects. Whenever a regency abuses their position or even uses their position at times, they generate strife. Unlike tyranny though, strife doesn't go hand in hand with generating a huge amount of fear in people. You might hate a tyrannical liege, but you're too scared to do anything about them. But where it's happened to an unpopular region, well, <laughs> you know, that, that would be bad, I guess, but not really. 
To this end, strife affects how likely other vassals are to start or join a scheme against a character more than many types of opinion. A regent who acts too much has a lot of unique opportunities, but does test the patience of their colleagues. So again, that kind of balance of you can do a lot of stuff, but you will upset your vassal, your fellow vassals, but also it kind of working towards some benefit for yourself. So it's probably worth the risk at times. A throne fit for two. Most commonly, you will enter regency when you leave your position of the realm for some reason. Maybe it's a feast in a neighboring realm. Maybe you've been kidnapped by a foreign power. That will actually increase how good intrigue is actually in the game, come to think of it. Your portion is defined as your domain and the lands of your vassals. So if the king of Bavaria goes on a feast in Bohemia, that would still trigger a regency. But if the holy emperor does it, it wouldn't. These regencies aren't too dramatic and don't offer the regent much opportunity for shenanigans, sort of akin to house sitting. The regent's job is to keep an eye on things, preferably water the plants, feed the pets, see vassals. <laughs> Basically keep the vassals happy and till their liege returns in short order. So these short ones, these short regencies, they're not going to have a chance to do much in those. It's basically, I think, the longer ones like uh, pilgrimage and stuff like that. Or if you get captured, they're the ones that uh, are going to see more and more problems occur. These short ones aren't going to cause you too much issue, I don't think. The regents can try their hand in embezzlement, maybe imprison some rival vassals that annoy them, or justify some trumped-up claims on a few titles. Depending on how much they can swing the scales in their favour, as soon as the leash is back in their realm, they'll dismiss the regent at any time, and it'll generally even happen automatically. So yeah, you've got that kind of <laughs> small time frame to do as much as you can, or do nothing. And uh, yeah, you need to get it all done before the, the ruler comes back and comes in and goes, yeah, you're done, get out of here, I'm back in charge, thank you very much or not, as we will see later. Thus, the liege knows they'll be able to spend some time away from home without the entire realm catching fire immediately, and the regent gets a bit of meaningful agency. A nice even trade. I think that is quite a good trade. It does give you, if you are a regent yourself, so if you're playing a vassal to the emperor and you do become the regent, there is going to be events kind of semi-oftenly where you can do things, but it's not going to be like crazy powerful immediately. You're not going to be able to you know, if he goes on a small hunt, you can't just take over the, the whole realm in, in like a week. But it's good that it gives you those little bits to do whilst you're waiting and things like that. Uh, but if you, things don't shake out like that, what if your liege is waylaid? Or what if some foreign power refuses to return them? If they are away too long, they give the region time to grow, to not just cement their power, but expand it. If this persists for too long and the scales of power get high enough, the region can expand their power significantly and they can entrench themselves. So this is like the tier two of re regencies. So you have the base regency and then the entrenched regency. Once a regent entrenches, they, the liege, and everyone else recognizes that they've got a lot of power in their fingertips. The scales shift back down to around the midpoint and in exchange, the regent unlocks a whole raft of potential new abilities to let them act as though they were the liege, revoking titles, retracting vassals, imprisoning people, etc. Whilst the liege starts paying prestige costs for some things that were formerly free. As they mentioned before, if the region gets more and more power, it weakens the liege, and then they have to spend prestige on things that would be free usually, which is really cool, actually, how that's going to work. Were you wondering why I didn't mention children and capable characters earlier when we were talking about how to enter regency? That's because when a region is called to serve such a character, everyone knows they're intended to be in for the long haul. When a child inherits, the or if a character becomes incapable, they immediately enter an intent regency. So yeah, if you're incapable or a child, you immediately enter the kind of super, super regent version where they're basically seen as the ruler in your stead. Whereas if it's not one of those scenarios, you're kind of seen as either co-leaders at worst, I guess, or they know they're just kind of babysitting whilst uh, you're away on a hunt or something. If an ordinary regency is akin to house sitting, then entrenched regency is more like having a housemate you're having problems with. You're both sharing the same space, and even if you'd otherwise get on, them being constantly around can really grain on the nerves. I think we've all had housemates like that. Worryingly, for most lieges, an entrenched regent cannot be easily unilaterally dismissed. They're going to have to work for it. So yeah, if you get an entrenched regent, you can't just sack him and go, yeah, you've got too much power, get out of here. They are entrenched. They can't just be removed easily. You've got to work on trying to get rid of them. Borrowed powers and you. So this is if you are a regent yourself. All right. So you've got a region. Maybe they're entrenched, maybe they're not. Either way, as they continue to swing the scales of power in their favor, they'll unlock more and more interactions. Each unlock is about either replicating powers, usually the liege would only have, or exploiting the region's due role as a vassal and executor of the liege's authority. 
or exploiting the trust placed in them by their liege. We loosely group these interactions together as borrowed powers. Kind of makes sense. They're basically a copy of what the liege would have. These interactions can model relatively minor or benign forms of corruption, or some things as sphere as title revocation from co-vassals. It could be a smidge problematic for the liege, depending on their regencies, <laughs> tries to have a go at it. So yeah, it, does it sound like it could be trouble for you? Well, that's because it is going to be trouble for you. So yeah, this is the um, the revoke title regent version. So yeah, as a regent, you can basically yeah, revoke titles from a fellow vassal, take them off him, take them for yourself, I guess. And uh, yeah, if he refuses, you can either press the claim in war or declare him a criminal to King Philippe. Oh, interesting. So even if they say no, I guess you can go to the king and basically just make up a lie about him and say, look, he's, he shouldn't have that place. I should have it. So uh, yeah, that's uh, it's cool that you get to get these powers as a region. It's crazy. You could have a really powerful region who just gobbles up land for themselves whilst you're, uh, whilst you're out of the way. Well, fortunately for the liege, because they ultimately are the source of authority here, many of the more serious interactions will go through them first. This allows them to chance to veto serious power abuses by their region if the liege has the prestige to spare. So again, if they don't have prestige and you've got a powerful region, they can probably just get away whatever they want because uh, you won't have the prestige to stop them. If both the liege and the recipient accept, then the interaction goes through as usual. If the liege accepts but the recipient refuses, then the region will generally get a choice to whether to back their claim in war or back down whilst generating a criminal reason on the recipient for both them and their liege, their punishment for disobeying the law of the land. This lets even a landless region cause some trouble in the realm. So yeah, it does work that way. So yeah, the kings go, yeah, give it to him. And the guy goes, no, nah, I don't want to. Well, he then gets a, uh, it's a criminal reason against them. So yeah, you can cause quite a lot of trouble. And the intention here was to give lieges some interest in what their region could do without letting them hard block everything, whilst requiring vassals to make a hard choice whether they want to give in to this type of political blackmail or stand strong and hope. In politics, as in war, you have to pick your battles. So yeah, sometimes I guess you're going to have to say like, yeah, okay, you can revoke it, I guess. And other times you can say, no, <laughs> declare war on me if you want it. Let's do this the old-fashioned way. And uh, yeah, see kind of how they play out. So the core loop, Regent Revoke Title. The most important tool in the arsenal of any region is the ability to revoke titles from co-vassals. Naturally, the liege gets a veto, but an important additional hurdle the region here is that the region also requires a claim on the order to even select the target. So, oh, so yes, they can't actually just pick anywhere. So, yeah, if the region doesn't have a claim on your land, they can't just revoke it. So that is actually a good way to balance this. I thought before they could literally just claim anywhere, but no, they have actually got off a claim. Obviously, if it is a region with claims on your land, you're going to have to, you know, butter them up a bit or try bump them off so they're no longer region because you know they could use that against you. So, again, another little kind of tier of complexity into the system, which is cool. Regent revoke title is only available around the midpoint of scales of power in an entrenched regency. Oh, so they, yeah, they can only use this anyway if they're in an entrenched regency. So it's not going to be like all the time they could use this. So there's no need to worry about your realm's boundaries getting redrawn every time you pop over the border for a feast. Yeah, you aren't actually going to see that super often, but when you do, you know trouble is on its way. Legal meddling, that said, when you're both one of the realm's great magnates and its temporary head, the convenient scapegoat, <laughs> where you can basically do things wrong and just say, ah, oh, the king told me to do it. There's a lot of things you can forge claims a little faster than usual. Enter legal meddling. So yeah, it looks like you can grab claims maybe. A learning challenge. Yeah, so you can do these and then you can do them via learning prestige or gamble some political prestige or commit significant political prestige. I'm sure they'll go over it in a second what that means, but it looks like you can use these ways to get a claim on a certain county. With this interaction, regents can use their learning or spend prestige, again, leveraging their political capital, in order to generate claims on counties of their fellow vassals. So <laughs> it kind of counteracts the point from above. You have got to watch out because it can just get some claims anyway. Using learning is free. Obviously, it's got to be good enough to, uh, as you can see here, got to be good enough to make it worth risking it. While prestige can be spent in two increments, a moderate amount for a straight 50-50 shot at forging a claim or failing, or a large amount to get a claim for sure. I wonder if that should be automatic. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Should it be automatic or should it still have like that 5% failure chance? I guess maybe not. It's a lot of prestige to use, but I don't know. I think having it automatic, is that good? Let me know what you think. I think maybe it should have like a 1% chance of failure anyway, but uh, we all know that would mean 99% of the chance it failed. This makes a region with a lot of prestige to spare something of a potential problem. If they have the power, they'll try to grab 
what they're entitled to. And if they're not telling to anything, they'll just grab it anyway. <laughs> True. A regent retract vassal. When the scale tips a little bit further towards them, regents can even try to retract whole vassals, providing said vassals would be du jour theirs. In kingdoms, at most, this likely means shuffling a few counts around. In empires, king tier regents, though, this means it can mean entire duchies that should rightfully be theirs. So, yeah, one tier below them, they can retract them and take the land themselves. As it says, as a kingdom, it's not too crazy because they can only mess around with counts. But yeah, as a if you are an emperor and you have a king as a regent, they can move around duchies and really do some sizable land grabs, especially in areas of maps where some of the duchies are quite large. So that'd be uh, pretty crazy to see. Bells and whistles, regent imprisonment, alongside with the main revoke metal retract cycle regions have a sundry of other powers to make use of one of these is the ability to imprison characters in their legion's realm this includes fellow vassals but also the courtiers of those vassals guests passing through basically pretty much everyone you get to uh imprison someone you imprison them you gain dread you also cause this strife which as we've seen above doing these means your vassals you know don't like you because you're kind of overstepping your bounds and uh, causing trouble perfect for someone so so close to being within your grasp and if they're landed and refuse since you imprison them in the resulting war anyway recruit some of your war costs as reparation so yeah you can obviously uh spiral out a little bit from that interaction scales of power level four i think this was the worst i think it was one to four wasn't it so you can retract vassals you can imprison fellow vassals courtiers within the realm leech can pay some prestige on mundane actions and this kind of the swing of how it works shift privileges this interaction consists of regency selling unknowingly duplicate certificates, titles, monopolies, and other administrative bric-a-brac to the subjects of a fellow vassal. A liege who needs to maintain their status as lord and arbiter couldn't get away with such tricks, but as a regent, you won't be around forever, so you can just kind of uh, <laughs> do some lying, and who's going to know quick enough? As with legal meddling, the regent can spend prestige to gamble or win, or test their skill to do it for free, in this case diplomacy. The regent gets a lump sum of gold and some garnered strife. The unfortunate targeted vassal gets a powerful negative county modifier to pair neatly with their newfounded grudge. So yeah, you just cause some uh, some bad stuff to happen and it costs you uh, resources and you might get some gold and all that good stuff. So just another little like interaction you can do. So plenty of things to keep regents busy. Siphon treasury. This is going to be the best one, obviously. One thing that any regency is capable, given their access to the liege's authority, is a little bit of casual embezzlement from the royal treasury. The funds are, after all, merely resting in their account. Embezzlement takes the form of a stewardship challenge. With the difficulty going up, the more you try and steal at any one time. This type of white tunic crime, white tunic crime, I love that, uh, is more subtler than merely stealing bags of silver, though, as they don't directly take the money from the liege's treasury. Their master would surely notice that. Instead, Depending on their region's stewardship, they still increasingly difficult to track intangibles from the Legion's realm. Characters with low stewardship will apply visibly negative country modifiers in the Legion's domain, something a canny player can easily notice if they're paying attention. Characters with medium stewardship will siphon a lot of control from one county in the Legion's domain, whilst those with high stewardship spread the amount over a few counties to be slightly harder to catch. And if the embezzling region has excellent stewardship, they will steal small amounts of development progress from multiple counties instead. Oh, that's pretty cool, actually, how that works. It's not just a simple thing, depending on how good you are at stewardship. The kind of the better it is and the harder it is for the ruler to find out you're doing it. Naturally, the more a character tries to steal, the harder it gets, and the worse the modifiers apply to the poor trusting liege. So, yeah, it looks like you a stewardship thing. You try to do this, a small, medium, large, or huge sum. Your atrocious stewardship restricts you to only a negative county modifier in one, one of your liege's counties. So again, if it's higher, you can do it against multiple, kind of spread it around. You get the secret embezzler. So you do get a secret, so people can discover that and find out you're embezzling from the liege. And you gain 50 gold. And this one county they can affect gets a modifier for five years that causes problems. And obviously the king dislikes you. It looks like here that he finds out... Oh, wait, no, 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 yeah, no. This is if you're successful. If you fail, you get strife, and the king finds out immediately, and he can Im imprison you immediately. So, yeah, that's kind of the roll of dice. You've got to have good enough stewardship to take the risk, I suppose. Once a character has embezzled, they generate an embezzlement secret. There we go. As you can see, you can get found out for doing that. But you may be asking yourself, what's the worst that can happen if you are discovered embezzling? Well, unlike many secrets, you can definitely put a price on the harm caused by embezzlement a handy convenient price. If a leech catches their region stealing from them, they'll demand restitution. 
in full. So basically everything you've stolen, they just come up to you and go, give me all that money back. So you could have been stealing for years. He finds out and then you've got to pay him back crazy amounts of gold. So um, that's really cool how that works. Maybe there's been a war, a rebellion, or just some preemptive partition, though. Maybe the embezzler is under a new liege and thinks they're safe from their old one. Well, regrettably, that isn't the case. So, yeah, even if you steal all the money and then move somewhere else, I guess maybe your land gets taken, uh, you move ruler or, or something like that, well, you actually get an event where you can go to the other ruler and say, hey, your vassal, when he was my regent, stole loads of money. You give me that. <laughs> you give me that money back. And, of course, the independent embezzler has no fear if they can manage independence. So, obviously, yeah, if they're they're somehow independent, maybe they were your vassal, they have an independence faction, they're successful, they get away from you, well, you can just attack their realm and uh, take it that way, I guess. So, cool to see how that works as well. Subsidize liege authority. Borrowed powers are all about using a liege's authority to benefit the regent. That is assuming the liege actually has any authority at all. And after all, if a king can't revoke a title, how can his regent hope to do so? So yeah, you can't circumnavigate, uh, circumvent even the laws of the land. So if the king can't revoke land, you can't do it. Regents desperate for power, thus can offer to help subside their liege's efforts at centralization, paying prestige to help them increase their current authority whilst taking a social hit for being the realm's stooge. Yeah, that's actually really cool. So yeah, you can basically boost the king's uh, crown authority temporarily it looks like so they can do things they wouldn't usually be able to do maybe and that's kind of how that reads you basically boost them for a while and then i guess it settles back to normal maybe this character has increased their own authority in the realm and very conveniently managed to blame the entire thing on a subordinate these are obviously the different kind of uh, vassals they talked about uh in a previous dev diary recently then own vassal contract last but by no means least any region with a shred of dignity to their name has some degree of power over their own vassal contract making countersigning a few extra changes a simple matter. So can you just change your contract? I guess because you're the ruler, you just go, yep, I'm changing all this. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and, and change. <laughs> Thank you. I, I no longer give you any money because uh, I'm giving the money to myself in a way. Ending regencies. All good things must come to an end, and so too regencies. Most regencies are nice and easy to remove, providing you're an adult within your own realm, not currently traveling, you can remove them at any time for free. When you return from travel, they'll generally be dismissed automatically even. Though there's still a manual dismissal button if you, I guess, if you want to do it otherwise, but it will basically just end as normal. Entrenched regencies, though, have more time to coil themselves around the leaves of power. Administrators, clerics, staff in the royal household, the nobility, some or all these classes support the regent's access to executive authority and removing them will not be quite as easy as writing a thank you letter. At the utmost level of scales of power, the region is so influential that the liege cannot even broach the subject seriously, and drastic action will be required. So yeah, level 5, you can't dismiss your region. He's just there. Tough, <laughs> basically. Below this, the liege can attempt to offer their region various gifts to speed their parting. Depending on the region, they may prefer different types of gift, or even be happy with not at all. But if they decline, they're merely delaying the inevitable. The mere act of a liege trying to enforce their authority on a realm is deeply corrosive to a regent's control and will start to swing the scales against them. So even just asking for it back, the other, well, your vassals will say, wait, no, yeah, the king should be in charge. Why are you hanging around? Like, give it back to the king or queen and, you know, you will get, I guess it gives them strife, maybe. They, um, you know, they realize like, yeah, no, the king's back. You should be putting him back in charge and not just trying to grab everything for yourself. And yeah, you can offer nothing, offer a favor, offer a offer a renown. That's quite cool. Uh, offer piety or offer gold. Offer a renown's crazy. I guess it kind of makes sense, though. You know, you're a, a big dynasty and a smaller dynasty is like ruling your kingdom. I guess it would make sense to be like, okay, I'll diminish my greatness a little bit. I'll improve your greatness, but go away, please. <laughs> In turn, if the region isn't careful, eventually they'll completely lose the ability to resist and risk getting nothing. So yeah, you, you maybe just want to take. If you're the region, maybe you just want to take what they offer. You don't want to push it too far because they, I guess they can ultimately just kill you or something. So maybe you just want to take that small gift or something to, to leave. So there we go, scales of power, level two. They can basically just do whatever they want, really. Discharge entrenched region. Dismiss with a wave of a hand. Get out of here. Offer a favor. So here we go. Yeah. Acceptance chance 1156. I might get nothing. 
So yeah, I guess the AI looks at it like, well, at least I'm getting a favor. Like he could just dismiss me anyway for, for nothing. He could just come in and remove me. So if he's offering me a favor, I'll take that because it's better than nothing. So uh, they have built that in that they're pretty much always going to accept it at that point because otherwise they'll get nothing, which is obviously a lot better. And then coups. The threat of a coup by your region is, in essence, something you've always seen coming. You can see what who your region is. You can see what they think about you. So we'll get to region loyalty in just another couple of sections. Yeah, we're only halfway through. Uh, you can see they're working up their scales of power towards the point where they can give it a try. So it's not going to be a surprise. You're going to know if they're potentially going to try to do it. It's less of a sudden shock and more about rising dread, ironically. Uh, anatomy of a coup. To start preparing a coup, the region will need almost to max out the scales of power. This unlocks the access to all the resulting content, giving the liege a solid way to fight back even against a very insipid coup. Unfortunately for the liege, ticking below this value doesn't invalidate the prep work a region needs to, to proceed. So as long as the region is persistent enough, they'll find a way. So scales of power level six, they can basically issue an ultimatum and permanent transfer of rule. They convince the, the majority of their liege, liege's powerful vassals to support the coup. Liege pays abhorrent prestige to, on mundane actions and coup are launched by a decision, which they're going to show in a second. So yeah, you can basically take over the realm officially. Once the final scale node is hit, the region gains access to character interactions and a decision. The character interactions allow them to contact powerful vassals around the realm, offering them promises in return for support. A simple majority of the realm's powerful vassals must support the coup for it to proceed any further. I guess that makes sense. It'd be cool if you could do it and just imprison everyone, kind of like a Knight of the Long Knives kind of thing. Like, I'm going to put myself in charge and I'm going to imprison all the other vassals and just take over the realm. That would be cool if they... It, it doesn't sound like you can do that. That would be cool, though, if you could do that. Just really just risk everything and just say, look, I'm, I'm just taking you all down and I'll promote some counts to dukes who support me or something like that. But uh, anyway, this is the version we've got. It sounds amazing anyway. There we go, Conspirator. Basically just like a scheme. You can go to him and say like, hey, I promise you nothing. I'll give you a hook. I'll give you a strong hook. I'll give you some money or I'll give you a lot of money. Will you support my coup? AI regions, a slightly more streamlined flow for this section, I guess to probably cut down on uh, processing and stuff like that. The requirements are broadly similar, but sanded back a little and forced to be a bit more active than they usually would be. So they actually pull off the odd coup without needing to manage human tier planning. Once the conspirators are gathered, the decision comes into play. It'd be interesting to see how balanced this is when it comes out. I wonder whether uh, it comes out and just coups happen all over the place and just different rulers getting replaced all over the map. So it is going to have to be balanced this quite a bit because I don't want to see coups all the time. I want it to be pretty rare. Let me know what you think in the comments. How often would you want to see a coup happen, I guess, in a general play of the game i probably wouldn't want it happening all the time maybe in counties more or even duchies maybe a little bit but i don't think i'd want it happening all the time at kingdoms and empires i think it would get a bit silly at that point but uh yeah we'll see i'm sure they'll do it where it'll be less likely and they can turn it up a little bit but uh yeah it'd be interesting to see how often this actually happens so this is the decision attempt to overthrow your liege our alleged king harold cannot govern without me but i could certainly rule without him all I need is a tactic support of enough of the realm's great magnates, some loyal soldiers, and an opportunity. So here we go. You just activate this decision. This are the these are the possible outcomes. So one of them is usurp all his highest tier titles. You usurp the Dijon capital of the Kingdom of Norway from the king. The king rem keeps all remaining titles. No matter what, King Harold remains a ruler. So I guess you take his kingdom title, but he would be the Duke of somewhere still. So he will still be a ruler somewhere in your realm. You're just now seen as the king instead. Your, your demands are rejected, but you still win. You take even more of his titles. If the realm is small enough, he can lose everything. So this is like the, the worst version. The top one, if you're the king, you can just accept this. And it's basically like a... Uh, you get removed from power, but you do keep a power base. So you could fight back, I guess. If you reject and they win the war, or they win uh, how this plays out, they can basically take everything from you, and it's a very bad time. So yeah, it's again, it's cool that there's more than one way this can play out. It's not just as simple as you take over, you get everything, you're basically the king. 
uh, there are different ways this can play out. So, and there are different ways you can do it. You can do it through diplomacy, intrigue, and prowess, which they're going to show in a second. And then the requirements, you need to have all these met to organize your conspiracy. So there's a lot here. You, you're not going to be able to do this really simply. You are going to have to put a lot of work into doing this. As it says here, not in prison, not traveling, not at war. Plenty of things keeping you from just doing this whenever you want. With these requirements filled, the region selects how they want to frame their coup. One focus on diplomacy, intrigue, or prowess, as we saw above. The skill they choose reflects the, the skill jewel that the legion must reply to, and which, if any, counselor they can call on to defend them. Assuming, of course, the said counselor isn't also in the conspiracy against them. So, yeah, you can uh, kind of, like, aim these at certain ways. You know, if you know your liege is terrible at diplomacy, and maybe their, um, their council member is also bad at diplomacy, probably a good one to pick. You've got more chance of it being successful. So, yeah, diplomatic coup, words can solve this. Intrigue, a few stabbings are necessary. <laughs> uh, that's like the motto of Crusader Kings. Or power, or oh, prowess coup. You choose violence. Obviously, you just go around um, having a bit of a war, I guess, if they say no. If the liege gives in, then their life and freedoms are assured, but their realm is forfeit. If they choose to challenge their traitorous region, depending on the framing, they might be imprisoned or killed on loss, but may also fend off the conspirators. If a suitable council or court position holder is available, they can be called in as a proxy. You can't just prowess against the king. If he's bad, they will call in maybe their best knight or something like that and they'll take their place and fight them off so uh, i think it prevents it kind of being gamified a little bit too much if, if that wasn't the case you could just have a bad ruler and just super abuse the fact they're bad at uh, diplomacy which i guess kind of makes sense but also i can see why they've built this in that you can have that fallback on somebody else to help you so there you go the long awaited coup the sharpened knives basically this is the coup taking place in a intrigue focused event I will leave a link to this in the description down below as always so you can look through these in a little bit more detail. The dev diary is so long I'm going to not skip through some of this but I don't want to go through, I don't want to read absolutely everything. I'll just read almost everything <laughs> in the way I do these. Uh, for regents, success means a massive victory. After all, coups take a lot of investment and risk to pay off. and need rewards suitably large that can be done in a simple cheap war. The regent takes every top tier title their former liege possess, the realm capital and the capital duchy if applicable. And if the deposed liege was an emperor, the usurper will take the kingdom title the liege held with the most de facto land in their realm, e.g. the HRE, that'd be Germany. So yeah, you take a lot. If you're successful in this, you take a lot from the liege. It's crazy. The price for this, other than any blood on their hand, is the cost of their promises to the co-conspirators and a rather high chance of an unpleasant nickname, a worthy trade. You, you get a load of bonuses, but if it's cost you a lot of political capital, I suppose, to get the other co-conspirators on your side it kind of takes away from how good it's been but i mean if you get like an empire and a kingdom and a duchy out of it you can probably afford a few uh, weak hooks here and a bit of gold there to uh, to get that especially if you're a lowly character you could go from being a count to being the emperor in i can imagine some crazy playthroughs i'm sure there'll be someone once this come come out where you're just a lowly count you somehow end up being the region and then you just go nuts and just end up being the emperor in a lifetime. Um, it's going to be insane, some of the stories that come out of this. And then the nitty gritty. So here we go. This is kind of ending, kind of getting to the end of the uh, the dev diary here. So just a few little extra bits. Loyalty, rather than just checking the opinion of the liege, regents have a special loyalty value affected by a wide range of factors with three bands to it. Traits, relationships, cultural traditions, opinions and even certain core positions all play into this regents with high loyalty are considered selfless they select mandate options that benefit their liege mostly refrain from using their borrowed powers much more willing to basically do what the liege wants if they're super loyal to you regents with low loyalty are listed as self-interested these characters aren't necessarily hostile to the liege but they're basically going to siphon off the gold and, and all that kind of thing use it a little bit here and there but nothing too crazy Self-interested regents are the only regents who will ever seriously contemplate a coup. So only ones that really dislike you are going to try do a coup. So again, this kind of balances the system. You're probably not going to see coups all the time because there's all these kind of things have to fit into place. If you keep your regent on your side, then they're not even going to really try do a coup anyway, which kind of makes sense. Finally, these regents in the middle are considered situational. They'll likely enjoy access to their powers, but aren't committed to taking advantage of it at any cost. 
Situational characters use borrowed powers on occasions, sometimes swing the scales, and will generally nab benefits for themselves during mandate events. So uh, yeah, they'll just kind of take a little bit here, take a little bit there, but not do anything out really out of line, which uh, is pretty cool. Succession, unlike titles, regents don't have a clear line of succession. Kind of makes sense, be crazy if they did, at least not as such. Like loyalty, a range of factors go into determining who the realm expects to be region, whereas loyalty generally takes into account the personal aspects of the character and relationship of the liege. Succession calculates a sort of rough social proximity. Things like shared faith and culture give a bump, as does being a powerful vassal or a counsellor. Family, especially close family, will generally dominate their top rankings, though lieges with royal courts also give significant weighting to things that have a good skill relating to the court type or speaking the court language effectively, and characters who can't speak the liege's main tongue can expect a significant dip. So there's basically a bunch of little factors that uh, work in succession, who the realm thinks should be the region, which I hadn't even thought about that's how it would work. I thought you'd just nominate whoever you wanted, but or someone could use a hook to become your region, which I think is the case they'll talk about later. But uh, yeah, there's basically going to be a suggested, basically the realm thinks this person should be a region, and you can say yes or no, or yes or no I guess. Uh, if you do want that to be the case. Designation, that said, the Tyler region isn't a true title per se. It's an office and one who a liege can technically appoint anyone they like. Designating a future region is as simple as using interaction. So yeah, you just say, you're the region. <laughs> That's it. Or maybe your low-born mate, Jeff. <laughs> you met on tour will be lord to fault, but he's a bit coarse and not everyone in the realm takes kindly to it. So again, this is where you're basically just giving it to whoever you want. You can appoint a lowborn, <laughs> a lowborn. Just be like, yeah, you, Jeff, you can be region whilst I'm gone because I know you won't mess around. But as you can see here, courtly vassals, ain't gonna like that. And anyone with a high succession chance will also dislike that. So uh, yeah, you can pick whoever you want, but there are repercussions for that. Or even your half brother, who's certainly better, but not exactly the right stuff. So again, a, a lesser version of that, depending on who you choose. In addition to securing the throne for yourself, though, there are one other major reason you, you might want to designate an official future region succession. If you die with an underage heir and a loyal designated region, your heir will receive a strong hook on them. Oh, that's cool. Expiring on their 21st birthday that compels a region to remain loyal. For your sakes, it was, after all, your dying wish. Oh, that's pretty cool then. Yeah, so yeah, if you have a loyal one when you die, yeah, it gives your successor a strong hook. They can't rebel against you, basically. They will always be loyal to your to your successor. I wonder, though, if it's you and you are the regent and the AI uh, child is your is your liege now, I guess you'll be able to stay loyal to them, but I wonder if you can just kill them and then they're next in line and you they wouldn't have a strong hook on you anymore, so you could then replace them. I'm not sure as a character player how that works. Like, I wonder if this means mainly with the AI, because I think as a player, you should be able to work around it in some way. Maybe you can't. Maybe you can't remove strong hooks of loyalty, basically. Becoming a region as a vassal. So this is if you're a vassal yourself and wanting to play as a region. Humble vassals can also practically seek future status as region. In addition to actively working for it by bettering their succession score, whether that be through murder or intense regime linguistics, you can directly ask the liege to nominate them officially via interaction. So you can just go up and say, hey, make me regent. If you have a hook, it looks like you can basically force them. Sadly for vassals everywhere, the liege can't designate a new regent whilst the old one is still in power. Oh, so you can't just replace a current one. And thus, during an active regency, they may have to take matters into their own hands. Fast moving are very risky. The overthrow regent scheme allows characters to attempt to stage an altered kidnapping, effectively cooing the regent and installing themselves in their stead. So yeah, you can have a new kind of uh, scheme where you basically just replace the region. You just go up to the king, go, he's disappeared somewhere. Maybe uh, maybe I should be region instead. And they go, yeah, I guess so, maybe. A uh, failure naturally involves imprisonment or even in success. This is an overturning of the liege's law and still a crime. Whether it's one the liege feels like enforcing likely rests on the relationship between the liege and their new would-be region. So, yeah, actually, no, looking at this, he knows you've done it. Uh, if he likes you, I guess he won't press that kind of, um, you know, the bad side of it. He'll just go, okay, yeah, maybe you shouldn't have done that, but I'll live with it for now, I suppose. And, uh, yeah, there you go. That, that's that's cool that you can replace them through a scheme. That is actually pretty cool. Uh, we are actually getting quite close to the end now because there is a section on modding, which I won't go through. I think most of us don't mod. 
But if you do mod, again, there'll be a link in the description. You can read through how you can mod this system. I can only imagine how some mods are going to work this. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Power sharing modifiers. Regencies also provide some slight modifiers to both parties. Generally speaking, regions take more stress due to the extra job, including taking more when entrenched, while lieges gain a little bit more stress loss unentrenched regencies due to them being away from the hustle bustle of rule for a bit. So again, that's another layer. If you are a region trying to do some bad stuff, you are going to be building up that stress. Maybe you'll, <laughs> you'll almost get to the finish line and the stress will kill you. Probably more interestingly to many of you, inside entrenched regencies, lieges gain some extra domain cap depending on their region stewardship. If you plan forwards, this lets you account for lost stewardship on future children, or should you get conked in the noggin in a tournament, smoothing out some of the transitions in rule, providing of course that your region still likes you well enough to not get ideas when they are called to serve. So yeah, that's cool because sometimes when you do have a lot of land, you have a high stewardship, especially if you're a long lasting character, you can sometimes have pretty high stewardship. So you can kind of consolidate a lot of land under you. And then, yeah, we've all had it where a child takes over and they have terrible stewardship and you go down to like one out of 10 or something, you know, no, 10 out of one and you're way over your domain limit. If you have a powerful region, well, not even a powerful region, a region who has good stewardship, you can smooth that out a little bit. So as your child, you know, as your actual character gets older, they build up stewardship. It's not going to, you're not going to have to give away stuff just before you come of age, which like I say, we've all probably had where we've just had a long lasting ruler who maybe was stewardship focused. They've got like 10 counties and then you die and you play as a child and they've got like two stewardship and you basically have to give away all that land just to not be crazy over the domain limit. So that is an that is a cool extra bonus again. like It's only like a small paragraph here. But that's actually a fantastic addition as well. And as I say, there's a huge bit here about modding. We're not going to go into that. I have no idea how modding works. I just play fantastic mods. I don't know. So if you are interested, you can read through all that. There's not that much, but there's cool bits about how you can change things. And then conclusion. So there we go. They're going to shout out to somebody on the forum who guessed all the correct uh this was a while ago now like i think like last month where they showed this off and everything was like blocked out so you couldn't see it but uh yeah this is the power sharing list all the different things you can do as you can see here a bunch of cool ones and that sums up everything i think regencies is part of the free update that comes together with tours and tournaments so yeah all this is free this is not uh, locked behind the dlc i probably should have mentioned that earlier in the video we're nearly an hour in I've only just mentioned it now, but that is when they mentioned it here. And uh, yeah, that's amazing. It's all part of the free thing. So even if you don't buy the DLC, you're going to be able to do all this cool stuff. So that is actually amazing. It kind of makes sense, but it's cool to see. They have said they want to keep all, well, most systems free. And that's how they want to do the DLC this time around. It's a fantastic way of doing it. And then they are just going to go into, this is a double dev diary. We're just going to skim through this bit. This is about the elegance of the empire. This is basically the free DLC you get. So we're just going to take a quick look about this. It's basically just a bunch of new clothing for different empires. As you can see, some cool... Is this Matilda again? <laughs> She's in every dev diary. Um, so yeah, it's just some cool extra clothing and uh, basically how they did it. Uh, like I say, I want to do a separate video on this because it's just, you know... I mean, look at these cloaks. They look amazing, actually. But uh, yeah, different new crowns based on historical real ones. They did one of these dev diaries at the launch of the game showing how they used real crowns and real clothing to reenact in the game. So, or recreate in the game as it were. And again, another cool crown here and how they've made it in game. And then a bunch of weapons and attire. So this is a replica of this sword here, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, basically that's it. Just kind of showing off all these new things. I look at this, this actually looks really cool. This especially on this uh, woman here looks awesome with like some extra details and things like that. So really, really cool. And then something for the rabble. This is just for like general people you can get these cool new helms, uh, some new clothing and some new, oh, a regal mustache. So there we go. You can get a fancy new mustache as well. So nice. There we go. And that is everything. Like I say, I've just skimmed through that last bit because it's just new clothing coming, which is always good, but nothing super like interesting for, for me to take even more of your time today. And then at the end here, just a few words about the roadmap. I covered this, like I said, in the previous video, but if you didn't watch that, basically they're doing a chapter two season pass and you get, get tours and tournaments, you get wards and wardens, the event pack, and you get legacy of Persia, which is the flavor pack. 
and you, know, you basically get all of that for one price and that's the content for the year that's that's coming so we now know what's coming and you now know what you're getting if you buy the season pass basically and uh that's it guys that was the <laughs> that was i think the longest dev diary we've done if you've stuck out to the end leave a comment down below saying you've made it here what's your favorite part what don't you like i think nearly everything here looks great so uh hopefully well not hopefully we will get our hands on it soon on may the 11th and uh, yeah hit that thumbs up if you've enjoyed it you must have done it if you've made it this far and subscribe if you're new here i cover the dev diaries i do a lot of crusader kings 3 content and i also play other historical strategy games and city builders all that good stuff on the channel so uh, subscribe if uh, that's your kind of thing but we'll leave it there for today and i'll see you in the next one